Okay. Uh, I guess we're ready to get started in the afternoon session. Uh, welcome everybody back. So uh, this section or um, this panel oscillates at the confluence of authorship and collaboration. And in a way, uh, this panel will explore current thinking about the role of authorship uh, within the urbanistic project and how that uh, role evolves in response primarily to ideology, uh, to diverse working styles and degrees of physical and political complexity, these ranging from sole authorship to newer open source models of practice. Ultimately, I think the work presented by the two panelists will single out working models in which the collaboration of multiple hands can result in something much greater than the sum of its parts. And I think we'll see that in, in the applied research that Edgar uh, will present in terms of sort of Africa and the global south, uh, as well as the sort of the, the open source platform that Ecosystema Urbano has, uh, uh, has uh, 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 set in place. So our, our first presenter is uh, Jose Luis Vallejo. He is a co-founder and a partner at Ecosystema Urbano with Benita Tato, who is uh, also joining us here. Uh, an innovative firm focused on an understanding of the city as a complex phenomenon, finding a common ground between urbanism, architecture, engineering, and sociology. Ecosystema Urbano is a team of professionals working in networks with experts from other disciplines to carry out innovative projects. Among their most recent projects are the Eco Boulevard in Madrid, Ecopolis Plaza, and the public space in front of the Spanish Pavilion at the Shanghai Expo. Uh, Jose Luis is also a professor at the Escuela Técnica Superior de Madrid, a professor of architecture, and uh, both Jose Luis and Belinda have been visiting professors in many, many institutions around the world, including uh, uh, GSC. Edgar uh, Pietrese uh, is holder of the DST, NRRF uh, uh, South African Research Chair in Urban Policy. And he directs the African Center for Cities and is professor in the School of Architecture, Planning, and Geomatics, both at the University of Cape Town. His most recent book is City Futures, Confronting the Crisis of Urban Development. And most recently, he was asked to serve on an international advisory committee for Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, curating an international exhibition titled Critical Mass, Design, and Urbanization. So, Welcome both Jose Luis and Edgar, and uh, we will begin with uh, Jose Luis. And maybe the uh, the, moderate, uh, the panelists should, should stay in the audience until the presentations are over, and then we'll move to uh, uh, to the table. But welcome both. <laughs> collaboration and collective intelligence and I will do it by presenting them from my own experience I will start by explaining how I was educated and will end up talking about how I approach my teaching today the presentation will be an auto autobiographical tour starting with the education I received as an architect and urban planner and later the transformation of my point of view of what means being an art, a professional working for society, showing the connections between the production of our practice and the evolution of surrounding society. I was educated in the 90s between two academic institutions, the School of Architecture in Madrid and the, uh, and the Badlet School of Architecture and Urban Planning in London. The first had a more technical formal, academic, orthodox, and disciplinary profile, whereas the second was more experimental and creative, providing a free-minded fr framework. But both, even if they were distant in their methodologies, they applied and their curricula, they were absolutely closed together in terms of ideas, ownership, and authorship. As students, we <coughs> all wanted to succeed, becoming the first one being the most original and innovative while creating ideas, prototypes, theories, or research. And we thought we did succeed. In the pre-Google time, 
it was not easy to check what was going on somewhere else in the world. So it was easier to believe you were the first one discovering something. On the other hand, the concept of authorship in architecture was understood and conceived as, as the individual author's creativity, and it was always above teamwork, which was neglected and considered a derogatory kind of collage. That's how it was educated. At both schools, every one of us tried to invent the wheel over and over again, and many wheels were invented during these years. At the late 90s, internet was starting. The World Wide Web starts running and becomes even more and more popular. At first, it was conceived as a way to share information in one direction. All sorts of co corporative websites launched their sites to share their official information. There was no way to interact, <coughs> to respond, or to react to this information. We could just be passive receivers as information flow exclusively in one direction. As an architect in the 90s, I was trained paying ma much attention to making architecture, understood as the production of objects. Architecture was about creating beautiful and sophisticated buildings. However, less attention was paid on public space, urban planning, or the people. So the question was, who, w who cares about public space. This steel and wood house is a small scale project based on the idea of creating an energy efficient space responding to the specific location regarding materials, position, solution, and however many of the decisions were made based on our formal concerns. We soon realized we cared about public space. Public space is the arena, the background where life takes place. It can bring a quality to your life and it also requires innovation, creativity and beauty. From this time is the project Eco Boulevard in the new periphery of Madrid, an innovative of the shelf element that combines existing materials and patterns to create a cooling system in the public space of Madrid. The aim of the project is dual creating a social arena in a neighborhood without identity, grown from real estate speculation, and generating climatic comfort to lowering down the temperature in summertime. We also realized with this project that working with complex <coughs> programs require a creative collaboration with other professionals with different backgrounds, since cities are complex organisms that cannot be tackled just from a physical point of view. This approach allowed us to get in contact with reality and society establishing new ways of communication between both sides would strongly influence our way of working as well as the result of our projects. After this experience, it was just not possible for us to understand architecture as the production of autonomous and autistic objects. From this point, the web evolved and started providing more open tools. The creation of blogs, personal log logbooks, the possibility of writing comments, etc. Internet 2.0 became more open and participatory, more accessible to anyone, and information was flowing multidirectionally, and we, citizens, shift from being passive receivers or consumers to active producers or, or prosumers. Today, if I have to check any doubt, I don't go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is the classic, classical reference, an institutional honor of knowledge. I would go to Wikipedia, or for language issues, I would use word reference, a site which is alive, which is not moderated by a single person or institution, but by the community. When I can launch questions and get responses from anonymous people, from any part of the world where I can take part in the discussions and forums where people discuss nuances and the slight differences between words, where meanings are not static but evolve as our society does. Society has changed and evolved and so have I as a professional connected with the surrounding society. 
From learning how to work as a group with multiple experiences over the, these years, we moved towards professional networking, where sharing experiences and ideas has become a regular practice. In 2008, we decided to share our projects under a Creative Commons license, which means anyone in the world can download it, copy it, modify it, reproduce it, print it, build it, etc., as long as they mention us. This concept becomes really worrying for those who still think the profession will remain the same forever. We only see the benefits from this, and we really believe there should be shift in our understanding of the profession and how can we engage again with the society to make our work more relevant and necessary to have meaningful role in the society. With this project, we won a second prize in a competition to create a shadow space to hold summer activities. The starting point is a low budget to cover the whole space with the standard means. Citizen participation and the reuse of a standardized object, the umbrella, <coughs> are the tools selected to make it, to make it possible. We never implemented the idea, but it was shared on our website. Later, we were surprised to find someone else in Chile who implemented it. We were happy to see the results. This is an experimental prototype of intervention in contemporary urban public spaces for World Expo Shanghai 2010, capable of creating the conditions to empower the use of collective spaces a self-sufficient climatic comfort generator that is being used not only as a breathing space, but as well as interactively real-time connected with the climatic conditions. This is a kindergarten in the suburbia in Madrid surrounded by transportation infrastructures and an industrial site in which the public space we incorporate creates the conditions where social interaction can take place while including the idea of education and sustainability. The whole waste waters of the building are purified by natural means in front of the eyes of the kids. You can see here, sorry, yeah. how it looks like alive. There is no sound. This is Spain, it would be very low. <laughs> <laughs> and they are also Spanish kids. <coughs> During this process, we discover internet as an active and most democratic public space. The platform where every citizen can express freely and horizontally. The space where ideas flow in every direction. Since then, we have been developing a series of projects linking both overlap public spaces, the physical and the digital. Ecosistema Urbano.org is a platform that develops social networks and manage online channels around the subject of creative urban sustainability, building networks to ch share knowledge and experiences. What If Cities is a web application and mobile app designed by Ecosystem Urbano to promote urban participatory and collectively collective creative processes facilitating consultation, exploration, and visualization tasks of a great variety of data. People can publish geolocated messages. Users write, write their ideas, opinions, or proposals in 140 characters, the same as a Twitter or as an SMS, and classify them by categories and locations so they can be viewed, rated, and shared in real time. La Noche de los Niños .org, the night of the kids .org, is a website where children can exchange their old toys with other children. An old toy gives you back a new friend. A toy exchange event took place during museum's night, and it was the launching pad for the platform. Mm. 
later on, the appearance of social networks, Facebook, Twitter, etc., enables anyone to be connected. The infrastructure is provided for anybody to express themselves uh, at no cost. By using these new tools, social movements as the Arab Spring, May 15th in my own city, in Madrid, Occupy Wall Street were possible and happened. People proved to the world that they can communicate, react, and self-organize, becoming an extraordinary power able to change reality. Today, urban designers and thinkers cannot just pay attention to the physical framework, but also to the invisible layers, communication technology, energy, information, social, even the spaces which combine overlapping of these layers, the overlapping of these layers are becoming a field of interest as a whole world, opportunities for architects and urban planners. There is an amazing amount of experimentation on the web as we all wonder how to bring back the physical space, the, to the physical space, the activity, creativity and interaction occurring in, on the web. Today, when we are asked who are our references and inspire, who inspires our work, we mention Linux or Wikipedia projects. We understand our work as a sharing knowledge, data, and promoting connectivity and interaction, acting as a catalyst to enhance the qualities of public space. City is not a single person or a single group work, but a whole community task. We work as mediators between ideas, concepts, needs, concerns, and shapes, solutions, creative responses, etc. When we talk about participation, we mean it and we put it into practice. <clears throat> now we are going to see 1000 Square, which is the winning proposal for the Urban Center competition in Hammer, a city in Norway. The municipality of Hammer launched this competition calling for an art intervention in this main public space. This is the video we sent to the jury as our proposal, a participatory process about bringing together local and worldwide participants to take part in the process of thinking and designing and designing in open source placemaking, connecting digital and physical workspace at the square. Instead of a more conventional individual artistic approach, we thought of creating a new design, a network design, process open to both the local community and the global community, providing on-site activities and online ones. part of the <laughs> proposal. <laughs> okay, well, 1000 Square was further developed during 2011 as Dreamhammer, a network design process created for the final design of the main square. Dreamhammer created an academic network with 206 65 students and nine academic institutions from five countries. On-site workshops and lectures with local and international creative guests. 1,300 students from the regions, elementary and high schools share their ideas for the square. A digital platform, dreamhammer.org, an open and participatory website that includes social network channels and gathers 
all the information collected during the process. Weekly live broadcast sessions sharing process and making it transparent with citizens. Online workshops open for hundreds of worldwide followers. A mobile app, Dreamhammer app, that lets citizens share in your references data, text, image, or, vi or video about urban aspects of Hammer. And urban actions, as temporary instant improvements aiming to arouse people's curiosity and call citizens to action and reaction on the square. A way of experiencing possible uses and solutions for the future square, but also directly changing the urban environment and people's perception of the space in short period of time and with a reduced amount of resources. These urban actions were called paint hammer, green hammer, green hammer, art hammer, play hammer, film hammer, or light hammer. Dream hammer turned turn start to get into a digital square by means of a large and international system of integrated communication and participation tools that connected it into a global network. We are right now in the process of translating and filtering the ideas collected through all these activities into a design, something quite difficult, I must say. So, society has changed dramatically during the last 15 years. But what happened to academia? <laughs> too, too, often, too often, the teaching schemes at architecture and urban planning schools are too disconnected from reality. The structure of the design studio is based on teaching models from the 19th century, and it has not evolved. The teacher is the owner of the knowledge and is the one who sets light to the student's path. We believe in education that should have its own tools of how to connect with reality and society instead of creating barriers. We understand our role of teachers is about creating the conditions for creativity and interaction, promoting the student to become an active part of the process. Moreover, at Ecosistema Urbano, we have developed a learning experience through a series of open online collective sessions on the internet. The name is urbansocialdesign.org. We call these experiences as they are not courses, but a personal experience engaging everyone. Now, we are going to see, last year we were teaching in Bergen, and as part of these uh, academic networks launched with the project Dreamhammer, we involved the students of, of the Bergen School of Architecture. And this is one of the urban actions that were, was done during this process with the students of Bergen.
Well, now, more than 10 years after I finished my education, I perceived reality with a full color range. Although I still have some serious after effects. And that's why I'm completely dressed in black still. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's part of the education I received <laughs> as being architect. So that's it. Thank you. Speak sign language, that's the difficulty, so I'm not sure what it should be. <coughs> well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this. Um, um, yeah, I, I was uncomfortable before I started because, you know, I was clearly a great crusher. I'm not an urban designer, I'm not an architect. I'm kind of vaguely something to do with planning. Um, but my um, academic and uh, and professional activist genealogy is completely in other world. So, and like most gate crashes, you know, I can only talk about what I know. So of course it's you know completely irrelevant to what most of you are interested in. Now that was bad enough. And then of course there was that slide of the academic in the front of the class <laughs> of a bugger. I'm like doubly um, uh, culpable here because I don't have anything cool uh, to show. So, uh, but I am wearing half black, so that helps. Out. <laughs> so, um, can I have a little bit more light because I wrote my notes as opposed to typed them? Even more arcane. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can stand there, no, it's fine. Okay, okay perfect. Because uh, my handwriting is pretty bad on a good day. Okay, um, so this was a difficult topic for me because. Um, I can basically talk for two days, pretty much straight. Um, I run, uh, I work in something called the African Center for Cities, and kind of everything we do is structured on the basis that you've got to co-produce, um, and that the only knowledge that is really anything worthwhile having or working with or deploying is knowledge that is co-produced. So we work... Um, at the university, uh, and I'm kind of from a very traditional university, hence the appropriateness of that image. And so the disciplines are powerful, and the professors in the disciplines are, are many gods uh, with their fiefdoms, and to kind of just get any kind of interdisciplinarity going is pretty tough going. So, uh, you know, so we, we do all kinds of, um, of, uh, of, of penny and subversive things to try and break through those barriers. Then in Cape Town itself, where the university is located, we run six uh, labs that brings together people from the public sector, uh, state government, uh, metropolitan government, private sector, NGOs, social movements, and then um, occasionally we even allow some academics in the labs. And then um, we, we convene a conference every two years with Wits University in Johannesburg, where we bring scholars from every single discipline that may have something to say or think about urban studies together and to kind of take stock of the state of the field in, in South African city studies. And the deal is that half of the papers must be from PhD students as a way of also messing about with some of these hierarchies that I spoke about. 
Um, and then in the intervening years, we convened these PhD students, and over a period of a week, we facilitate a process where six senior faculty and these students think through their ideas to, in a way, refine, polish, recast, cross-fertilize their papers, and that then becomes the backbone of this conference every two years. So that's a very different kind of experiment. And then the rump of the work that we do is on the continent. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, African universities were pretty much destroyed in the, in the structural adjustment period from the 80s on. And within that, uh, liberal arts, arts and urban studies got a severe knock. So most universities, so some countries don't even have an architecture school, let alone, um, uh, you know, um, that there isn't enough funding. It just doesn't exist in the first place. Uh, urban studies, of course, is still a foreign word, um, or urban design, as, as I, I, I should say. And, and so we're talking about a very different category of absence of black, right? So a big part of what we do is the basic proposition is if your urban population on the continent is going to go from 280 million at present to about 800 million in just the next 20 years, if these governments don't invest in building the intellectual capability within the higher education institutions, we're fucked, basically. So, um, so the question is, that's a loud point, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, uh, um, you know, sort of how do we do this? And so what we do is we invest in these networks that build platforms for the, for the sharing of resources and ideas and capabilities so that all of these universities can try and make something out of nothing as a way of building this agenda but also producing knowledge in a different way and most importantly animating a new generation of scholars. Because part of what happened in this 30 year window that I spoke about is that the senior faculty had to resort to consulting. I know that's kind of normal, that's part of what you do in, in your disciplines. Um, but uh, this is not consulting of the kind that you do as part of your research practice. This is consulting to put food on the table because you don't get paid a salary at the end of the month because the government has kind of run out of money to pay academics. So research cultures were eroded. Um, very little investment in renewal of curriculum, and so on and so on. So the big focus is really that kind of collaborative work. And so, I, I, so, so it's been a tough couple of years to figure out how to choreograph and maintain and fund and support these things. So a lot of very different kind of lessons about, about knowledge networks and co-production that I can talk about in that regard. Finally, and this will bring me to kind of what I will really focus on today, is that we also absolutely convinced that there is something going on in the global south that requires us to think in much stronger comparative terms. And so we try to do a couple of things to build bridges with universities and research centers and social movements that work in the global south. And that again presents a different order of challenge and problem and so on. So that's why I, I, you know, I, I could go on for a long time talking about the focus of this topic, but what I actually want to do, and, and I've changed what I was going to talk about after yesterday's discussion, and so my, uh, hence the written notes and, and not the typed ones. Um, because I think that, that what I want to do is use the, this, this focus to really make explicit what the bigger epistemic question is for us. Because the issue of co production and working collaboratively is one aspect of a much larger epistemic agenda, and that's really what I want to focus on today. This epistemic agenda comes out of an aporia of context, an aporia with two dimensions, right? The one is very much confronting the kind of hangover that you have when you've read Mike Davis's Planet of Slums, um, and or you've watched documentaries by filmmaker Soryo Samura, for example, Living with Corruption, which is an incredible account of everyday life in, in Kibera, in Nairobi. Or you've watched Philip de Bock's recent film about, about the ritual function of cemeteries for young people in Kinshasa. This is this aporia of how to think about the presence and the overwhelming sense of, of, of the constitution of subjectivity through violence, through routinized violence in the now, right? Where 70% live in slums, etc., etc., etc. There's another dimension to this, uh, to this aporetic moment, and that is, it's not just bad enough that we've got to contend with making sense of 
this scale of violence, but that the second moment is this recognition that it is kind of interminable. 40 years from now, things will be pretty much as bad, if not worse, right? Because of the particular location of these cities and societies within the global economy and the global structure and so on. And so we have no choice but to think the epistemic question in this painful, burning moment of violence, of systemic violence that satures everything. And this is interesting because it comes alongside another um, interesting um, yeah. interesting um, moment in urban studies more broadly, right? Where I think, and I want to talk about four um, really complicated, vexed contestations going on about what is both the founding bases of urban studies in the, in the contemporary moment, but also what are the orientation points, the vistas, for framing and thinking about urban studies at the moment. Because resolving or attending to this particular epistemic crisis is in fact attending to this much larger canvas. And so it is important that we put this larger canvas square and center into the debate. Because this is what is at stake. This is what we're engaging with in trying to come to terms with, with, with what I'm talking about. If I can just get my Mac to do what it's supposed to do. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so these four, um, this kind of simplistic, I'm sure we can share glass, right? Is that like really gross? Um, to share. Uh, that seems very open source to me. So, um, um, I'll start with this blue thing uh, at the bottom here, this blue blob. Uh, sorry, as you can see, I've got serious design uh, um, handicaps. So my apologies to terrible, you know, my apologies to the to the architects and urban designers in the room that I've got to resort to smart art templates in PowerPoint. Be that as it may, hopefully it makes the heuristic point. That um, I think uh, probably the leading author making this kind of point that there's a different gravitational center to thought in urban studies at the moment. And Ananya Roy's work, of course, kind of stands out as a good example of this. Drawing our attention to making sense of this demographic explosion. And what her project tries to do, which I think is pertinent, is that she argues that finally this is creating a stage for a moment of excavation. And so in some of her recent work, she's kind of demonstrated how over the last 20, 30, 40 years, there's been a kind of post-colonial uh, subaltern set of knowledges that have been ignored in the bigger urban studies project. And she kind of documents the regional manifestations of this and so forth. And this is, of course, really interesting, and a big part of that project is really that act of recuperation, right? And that that in and of itself is important to shift attention away from what is traditionally considered the canon in urban studies. But there's, a, there's another movement at stake then, and it's a kind of a cross-pollination movement, right? Arguing that we're now at this point where there's this, at least this acknowledgement of this subjugated subaltern knowledge is that can, if cross-fertilized, produce interesting new insights and bases for theorizing and thinking about the urban question. Of course, her work um, connects very well with uh, the really interesting volume by uh, Raywan Connell called Southern Theory that provides this kind of bigger canvas looking at sociological theory and social theory, and again, what that project looks like at that scale. And, and these kinds of recentering or decent destabilization of the canon is, of course, a really powerful current that is, I, I would argue, pulsating through the academy at the moment. But I think what is interesting about this work also is that there is a partiality to it, right? That it is, in a way, hobbled a little bit by its over-reliance on a particular discourse within post-colonial studies. And what I find often missing from this work is really an appreciation of just the incredible diversity and the explosion of practice and materialities that is arising in the global south because of just the sheer scale of investment and the sheer scale of resource uh, demonstration. But we can come back to that, it's not the occasion to talk about that. 
The second point I want to draw attention to is this body of work that I think has been really interesting, kind of at the intersection of, if you will, the margins of urban studies in the north and a big body of work emerging in the south around this idea of everyday urbanism. Um, I won't go into the detail of it, but in the US context, of course, Margaret Crawford's work comes to mind. Um, and there's a big tradition uh, around from Asher Min and others in the mid-1990s and so on, drawing attention to the ordinary city. Jenny Robinson, in her work, taking that forward into a book link study. And of course, the person whose work, I think, is probably kind of circulates most widely on this and, and is most articulate is Abdul Malik Simon, who's tried to really suggest that this idea of the everyday, one can almost read as a form of infrastructure, people as infrastructure, right? And that what is really required at the heart of the urban studies project is this, this capacity or this attentiveness to this micro detail coming back to the earlier theme of micro urbanisms. But within that, there is a very important set of references that there's a suggestion that the idea is not a celebration of the banal or the mundane. It is not necessarily a normative step, right? There's no prejudgment that there is good to be had within the fine grain of the everyday. It is simply an epistemological point to pay attention to great variety and diversity at the level of mundane reproduction. And that within that, within that phenomenological sensibility, where one, where one recognizes the constitutive nature of the ordinary, we begin to confront ourselves with just the mass of diversity of practice, which in and of itself belies then this attempt to typologize, to categorize, to create these lumpy categories of southern urbanism or Asian urbanism and so forth and so forth. So an important different moment related to this idea of southern urbanism, but I think also somewhat at a different angle that is a bit of a critique with some of that literature. Then, moving on, I, I shouldn't take too much time on this, but um, is this very interesting um, recent literature in, in, in part in, 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 in social theory, but also in political philosophy, where there is a, a, a kind of opening up of the idea of, of ontology. Right. Uh, the influence of Bruno Latour in this case, at the network theory, suggesting that the way we have thought about materialities have been far too inert, too stable, too solid. And that in, in fact what is really more relevant, particularly at this moment of profound complexity and constitutive risk and uncertainty, is an acknowledgement and an opening up to what is called effective vitalist ontologies. Right? This idea of, of actants or actor, um, actant assemblages as, if you will, at the base of both reality but also the capacity to move things forward and move things differently. And this is really important because I think it is something that's connected to this last area where there's a recognition that materialities isn't about singularities but it's about networks and the fundamental implication of different kinds of networks. Are there few? believe in open systems theory or other forms of systems interactions, that this is a, a very different way, again, a profound challenge to knowledge production, but also the interpretation of phenomena. And there's, of course, a connection between these things. So my contention, basically, is that we kind of right smack bang in the middle as we confront the second urban transition that the world is going through, as we confront this moment of the exhaustion of consumer capitalism, as we confront this moment of, if you will, the, the, the obsolescence of if, in conventional regulation, the welfare state, etc. It's all these categories that have held together, if you will, um, our sensibilities of governance, our sensibilities of the economy, of citizenship, etc. As all of this, as, as we in this maelstrom, if you will, the urban emerges as the only touch point to begin to think about how to recalibrate and reconfigure these ideas. And so it's a really, really profound and overwhelming moment, which we now am um, suggesting have to set aside these aporias of violence that we're living through at the same time. So how do we think about the knowledge project within that context? And, and so the, the suggestion is that we kind of have to figure out living at these moments of tension all the time, right? Straddled between, on the one hand, the absolute necessity and importance of, if you will, the old 
age ideas of empiricism, of data, of understanding trends, of understanding scale, of understanding velocities, of understanding what is going on, what these materialities are, even if they are unstable, but at the same time also paying very, very close attention to intimate ethnographies, right? and that it's not an either or, that there is such a ridiculous debate to suggest that it could be either or, but it's about what that articulation is. But it's not only that, because of the crisis of the moment, there's also this imperative to act, to be able to enter into the world on a daily basis and to figure out what to do because of the scale of the emergency, because of the vast prevalence, if you will, of, 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 of the condition that Hagen Ben, of course, describes as being life, right? So what do you do? But we also know that if we do more of what we do now, all of these micro actions we talk about, it does not solve the systemic problem in the long term. And you act in the face of that continual reminder of your own obsolescence, right? And so what you end up with is then, I suppose what Lefebvre have suggested, that all that remains at the end is art, right? You've got to resort back to the aesthetic. You've got to resort back to the poetic moment of resignation to that which cannot be understood which cannot reveal itself, but needs to be sought, right? And so this is a sensibility. This, of course, is not, again, an either or. But my suggestion is that the, the project of figuring out how to be, how to act, how to intervene has to be in the face of an acknowledgement of all of these impossibilities and yet to act. And what that then means by definition is, is, is I think, two things. One is this. Um, idea of my computer working, please. Um, okay. No. It's like, just stop it. This is like my, my three-year-old son. It's like it's exactly the same. I feel like he just absolutely doesn't do what you ask me to do. Okay. okay. It's like, I can, okay. Yeah, now it's working. Um, how much time do I have? Okay, I'll, I'll read. <laughs> okay, so the, the kind of two, two points that I just wanted to uh, make now was one is that it returns us to the political, and I don't have time to talk about that, and um, there's kind of a whole body of work about how to think about relational politics and different political moments, which allows us to think in different temporalities at different scales, etc., etc. But I want to kind of go to this idea of co production. And end off with uh, a, a very grounded example that, that we're in the process of researching at the moment in Cape Town in a particular uh, uh, slum area. And, and just kind of end off with something about design so that uh, there's hopefully a, a connection to it. So this example is, uh, is a project in, uh, so this is the Cape Town, the metropolitan area. And uh, where's the thing? Um, So that's the downtown, Table Mountain faces that way. Uh, so the iconic image you'll see of Table Mountain is there. Um, and this is what we call the Cape Flats. The wealthy people live on the foothills of the mountain and the edges of the coast. Um, and the poor people live here. And this is um, uh, the poorest people live over here. And this is the area called Kailicha. Um, it's uh, right. um, it is a, a, a a very large uh, suburb now. Um, uh, it, was, it was originally built for about 200,000 people. There's about 800,000 people living there now. And there's this interesting project going on where, and I'm not going to go through the detail, I'll, I'll just show you some of the manifestations. But basically, um, uh, as in the case of Latin American cities and so on, violence, big problem, uh, constant problem, um, and there was a belief that one could only deal with that through a collaborative process of, uh, of social design. And this is kind of what this project explains. And uh, it started off, it spent two years basically um, rounding up and engaging with unemployed young people in the, in the township. And it trained them as researchers and it trained them to do door-to-door -door surveys. And over a period of two years, they basically just collected information about economic life, 
but most importantly about crime and different categories of crime. And they then generated these maps, which are time series maps eventually about different categories of crime, and essentially tried to, through this, figure out when and where what kinds of crimes were happening, right? And this diagnostic was all just to basically get to a point where you could isolate the particular points in space where interventions needed to happen. And then at that point, um, uh, the architects, the urban designers, the community-based leaders, the local churches, etc., etc., formed various structures and organizations to begin to explore different design responses and to them. But the basic uh, uh, diagnostic that it produced then allowed for a kind of a, a capacity to read where the key acupuncture points could be and how to begin to think of a public infrastructure investment framework to systematically leverage in different kinds of investment, but also reorder and restructure movement between key public facilities, public parks, schools, uh, transport interchange points, and so forth. And um, through this, they were then able to break this up into four phases. They completed the first three. Um, this is uh, one of the key axial points uh, around there. And then every aspect of these different precincts and so forth was basically driven by these localized committees that they trained over a period of time, um, both in design principles, but also to articulate what it is people wanted and so forth. There's then a whole suite of different interrelated activities that gets constructed. But the key point about this is that the maintenance of these facilities and the employment opportunities around it are all retained as informal and the accountability sits back into these community organizations. Right? Um, and this is an example then of the kind of uh, one of these activity hubs. Now our slums are, are, are what's that? Horizontal, is that right? Yeah, horizontal mm -hmm. and one story, right? So these activity boxes are constructed on key points to create these vistas. This then becomes multi-purpose functional centers where the community does different things. And these are insertion points, that's the same structure over there, to create basically then a safe area for kids. Because the, the, the two categories of, of target groups of violent crime are, are children whose parents are working and are home alone during the day and, and women, of course. Um, and this is just one, so this is the most important metric, is how many people we kill in our communities. And as you can see, post and uh, pre and post this intervention has been a dramatic de in decrease in, in the murder rate for this particular community. So th that's of course a much more complicated story and I'm not going to, it was kind of just I thought it was important to, uh, to kind of register that there's also this very kind of alive set of things happening. But in a way when I interview the people involved in that process and I ask them, so what does this mean for how you think about the design process and what have you learned from it, these are the kinds of things that they tell me. I don't have time to go into it, but I'll come back to it uh, in discussion time if there is. But if you scale that up to the bigger, if you will, settlement question in South Africa or in other African cities or whatever, there's kind of fundamentally four things that have to be resolved in these collaborative processes, right? And in my reading so far, our designers are not able to mediate these conversations through a spatial register. Right? And I have this constant argument with them. And so there is often a fallback on a kind of a, what's the word, on a kind of repertoire of spatial intervention or response that is exactly from what you were saying, there's my fellow speaker, um, what you were saying, a kind of a, 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 form, a formalized training as opposed to a capacity to immerse in context and respond with a repertoire of responses. So anyway, but I'll leave it on that and open it. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for two fantastic presentations, and uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to, uh, uh, to the discussion that's going to emerge. And uh, following the tradition of this morning, I promise I will test your memory with uh, uh, collecting five to seven questions and then passing them along. Uh, but before we actually open it uh, to the audience, maybe we could start uh, a brief discussion here between the three of you 
that in a way begins to speak a little bit about this relationship between the singularity of a design idea, in a way of a vision, and in a way the transformative effect uh, that such an open source platform, right, or the, uh, uh, sort of the, the web or the networks that you've set up, uh, uh, how, how do these networks begin to empower that idea? Maybe focusing sort of both on the possibilities but also on the limitations, right? What can an open source network not do? Uh, and what are the challenges that, based on your experiences, both in the case in uh, South Africa, but also in, the, in your work, what are the limitations that these networks have had? Well, maybe my, this is my partner, Belinda. Uh, maybe she, uh, since I talk a lot before, she <laughs> answered the question. But for me, like, I, I mean, I'm not presenting, <laughs> I'm not presenting any solution. Right. Here, I mean, even if uh, I know I was a bit provo provocative with uh, against academia, I don't really feel like we have to provide for solutions. We are just testing. I mean, and I really enjoy when I test something. I don't know what's going to happen, and I don't know which is the solution. So that's that's what makes me really. I mean, makes me nervous, but also <coughs> like, uh, I mean, I, w I like to, to do it. So I don't, I don't want to provide any kind of solutions for what means working this idea of uh, network design is just I show what the things that we test uh, really online. Okay. I don't know if I have the solutions either. <laughs> well, I would say that um, in this kind of uh, creative commons kind of new approach is just something as Jose uh, said that we are testing, not, not us, but the whole society. And uh, it's, it's just new tools, and we just have to drive these new cars and find out trying not to crash somehow. And I'm sure that if we uh, use these tools in a great way, we will be successful and we will provide beautiful designs and very concrete and appropriate for the setting. And the, But if we don't, uh, it will be a total disaster. I think uh, we could make a very simple comparison uh, with uh, with uh, programs, with software. Uh, you know, you remember that when we started with all these 3D programs and uh, AutoCAD and all this, uh, there was a lot of people out of our profession that were saying, well, now, now everything is so simple, you know, you, you just click and then the, the design is done. And of course, even if these programs are very much sophisticated, you can still provide the best solutions and the worst. So that's what I think also with this kind of openness. Uh, so it will be the skills and the abilities of the designer to get uh, the most out of it, or just the worst. So I wouldn't say, but it's just a good tool, anyway. Edgar? Yeah. Um, I'll just narrate one example, um, just, to, just you know how tricky some of this stuff is. So there was this really creative guy in Cape Town, and he had this idea that, um, so one of the contentious issues in post apartheid South Africa, of course, is street names. Right? As you can imagine, what neighborhoods are called. And so there's been this unresolved political process to rename streets and all of these things. And he thought, okay, cool ideas. Um, two things. One is that um, because of the apartheid design history, uh, neighborhood suburbs were large. So small neighborhoods were never encouraged, right? The identity of small neighborhoods, small places. And, um, and, and so some people think that part of why we've got such severe social problems uh, in terms of social violence and other things is because of the amorphous nature of place. And so he came up with this idea to create a web-based platform um, called My Neighborhood. And the idea was to run a campaign for people to nominate themselves and to democratize the process of renaming suburbs and streets and to create a different geography of granularity in terms of suburb and so on, how do people feel? And of course, uh, you know, and, and, and the, so it was very funny. One, because of course the only people who could participate are, are wealthy young kids who's in university and have access to the internet and computers and so on. And the reference points were all European and American. So it was, you know, so it was the Bronx, it was Little Harlem, it was, you know, it was, anyway, so it was kind of really bizarre. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and the second thing um, was that, that they were absolutely convinced because it was an open source platform that therefore it was legitimate, right? So there was kind of this naive sense of, of, of what enrollment means in a highly unequal society. So that's kind of just a story to, which, which is a response indirectly to your question. But of course there's a bigger issue which, which is that these are fantastic. 
films and instruments, right? So what are the intervening mechanisms and the combinations we need with other things in a context where there's right, a digital right. divide and inequality in, in, in digital access? And I think that that's a fantastic question I'd be very interested in. Right. Which I think in a way goes back to the idea of the micro-action and the systemic pro uh, uh, problem that you introduced. But I think with that, sort of along the same topic, maybe we can open it to the audience and uh, take uh, uh, maybe two questions at a time. We'll, we'll give you guys a break <laughs> since it's the afternoon. <laughs> so which side wants to go first? Um, I really like both the presentations. They really made a, in, uh, I guess, surprisingly, they really made a nice compliment, at least for me, in terms of, uh, I guess, the concept that comes through for our discussion is the idea of co-production. I use the word Edgar, and I, I like that thinking about co-production. And so my questions for both of, or all three of you, have to do with, uh, well, there are a couple things. The first thing that occurs to me is I'm wondering if we could distinguish between the co-production of knowledge about cities as opposed to the co-production of cities. Because where, where does the knowledge chain and loop come in there? I mean, both of these things could happen with both of the techniques, but I think they're really different projects. So that's the first question. Um, the second one, I, I, it's another form of Edgar's response to, to Felipe's quest, um, question, but I, I was really interested in hearing this through the lens of my own work on violence with the question, that who is not involved in the co-production relationship. And not so much just our typical answer, which is the rich people have access to technology and they're not involved, but thinking about it in the more quotidian uh, uh, sense of the global south in cities where, as we heard this morning, sometimes 60% of the population is informal and there are a lot of illicit activities, yet they dominate the, the physicality of the city uh, these are probably not people that are invited to be involved in the co-production of either the city or knowledge about the city. And then that raises a larger question about um, inclusion and the nature, or maybe even the, the phenomenology of the relationships of power and status um, of co-production of knowledge. I mean, and just beyond the usual rich versus poor, I think that there are other categories of who gets to be involved in making the city. Uh, the, and that I think that has a that has, is a challenge to the architect or the urban designer who I see, and maybe this is my third question to ask you: Where do you see the urban designer in? What, what do you see the role of the urban designer in this process? Is it just is he or she just an enabler of that conversation of co-production, or a synthesizer, which comes through in the Spanish project? Sometimes you are doing a synthesis. In the South African projects, I'm not exactly sure, but we know from your slides that planners and government officials are involved somewhere in that knowledge chain. Uh, where, what role do they play, given that they're listening to and not purposefully not listening to some of the people who are uh, in the physicality of the city they're designing? Well, I think since Diane asked three questions, I think, I think you, can, you, can, you can go directly to answer and then we'll move to some, uh, some, uh, some additional questions. Okay. I, I can answer, I don't know, one aspect of one of the questions, <laughs> which is, um, I mean, I can answer it from our own experience. It's like, we are, I mean, we sometimes we have the criticism, okay, you are using tools that maybe they are part of the population that they don't have access to it. I can, I mean, answering from our own experience that we have tried, I mean, we are not saying that this is the only thing we have to do is working with, with these tools. It's like uh, finding ways in order with this idea that I try to communicate of a new public space which is on top of the existing, which is overlap. Mm -hmm. And we try to work with projects that create links between these two worlds. And, and for us, maybe this, this public space which is uh, overlap with, uh, with the existing is maybe at this moment, uh, maybe it has a higher degree of freedom than the real public space in, in which we live in. So we try to also, with this idea of incorporating people that maybe they don't have, we, we, for example, I can talk about an experience we have in a neighborhood in which was mainly elderly people, that were, they were not direct users of the web, 
But we work with people that we, we call it like urban activators. They were students that were, were trained and they were in a way infiltrating the neighborhood and they were helping the, this idea of connecting also uh, generations. So they were uh, creating between them kind of ecosystem in order to, to be able, uh, able to, to access to the, to the project we were developing. So it's like a, a, a whole uh, network of tools, uh, I mean, using the, the, the existing uh, world and also the other one. Yes, but I would like to make a point about the participation and the success or not success. I don't know if it's here. Uh, because, um, you know, I come from Spain when there is not such a huge participation kind of culture. I always say, you know, the only way we participate is by voting every four years and not even, not even everyone does it. So it's just a kind of a lack of trust in the system. And there's, uh, I don't know, the highest rates of participation we ever get is like 70% uh, or 67 I mean, you know, when they, we have elections. So that means that 30% of the people think they just don't care. So we just assume that even if we make our greatest effort to bring everybody in, there's a certain amount of people who would not trust the process or who have not a very clear idea of what was the process for. And that's also because um, you know, participation is great, but sometimes, even if it happens, maybe it doesn't lead to a very concrete result. And people say, like, you're taking my time, you know, I'm going to put my energy and, uh, you know, emotions on that, and then nothing will ever happen. So that's, that's the, the risk, I would say. And there's so many kind of negative experiences in the sense that there's been this participation and so on, and then nothing happens, or something happens that is not related at all to that process. So people are kind of suspicious. And, uh, and also, sometimes it's not very clear your role in the sense, is, you know, are we the, the city planners? Are we outsiders? Who are we? What, what, why are you, you know, asking me questions? Why do you want uh, information from me if, if I don't know who you are? So uh, what I'm saying is that we also have to relax a little bit in the sense that at least we have to provide the, the possibility for people to participate and just assuming there will be a certain amount of people who are not interested and that's because they don't even go voting. So, I mean, Hi there. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. That's three, three, three questions that <laughs> you know, yeah, can keep us busy the rest of the day. So, um, on your first issue of knowledge of cities or or, or, or co-production of the city itself. Um, so I'll respond from South African context because uh, you know, when it's got to kind of have a reference point somewhere. Um, and in the, it's both, so that's the first question. On the, the knowledge of cities, uh, basically, South Africa is, has really kind of gone the whole hog to embrace all of the participatory democracy stuff and blah, 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 it's in legislation and so on. And the truth is, it doesn't work at all. Okay, participatory processes are as boring as hell. Um, and, uh, and, and so formalistic and, you know, it's all about, yeah, anyway, it is terrible. Um, and so there's something for me about the animation of that process once you've won the political space to do it and now you kind of mess it up by kind of putting everybody to sleep, right? So, so, so that's I think an interesting question is how can we animate the participatory democratic process uh, so that the, the production of, of the knowledge of cities is in a way broadened, opened up and so on. And so, you know, there is a tendency now of opening up. I mean, we're trying to mount an exhibition in the city in, in a year and a half's time, where I'm trying to force all the researchers involved in the center to, we've created a frame where we said that there's three layers of knowledge. There's a core, um, there's an outer ring, which is the academic project, reference, scientific, in the literature, etc. There's a, a layer in the middle, which is about, if you will, the policy translation. So what does that mean for a practitioner in the policy realm? And in the center, that is the popular, right? So if you have to communicate the core idea from your research findings into a medium on two panels for a grade 12 student in a high school um, that is interested in, in our version of, of hip hop quieto, what would you say? How would you communicate your findings, right? And the exhibition will try and use all of the different tools and mediums to exactly do that kind of articulation across these different genres of knowledge. Um, and that ties in with, with your second point. The other point I just wanted to make very briefly, and uh, I mean, I, I may come across as a little bit skeptical of, of, of this, and that's not the point at all. 
One of the things that I think is an incredibly missed opportunity is the way in which the private sector, under this, this rubric or this discourse of the bottom of the pyramid, which is puke a little bit, but um, apart from that, I think have done amazingly interesting stuff to really understand how do you penetrate a layer of society that most of us have no idea how to access, right? And have thought about cell phone technology in very interesting ways, exactly around enrollment, around trying to understand what are the calculations people make if they have very little money? What do they prioritize? And I think within that, there's fantastic opportunities for designers and so on to kind of hijack those innovations and technologies in the private sector and redeploy them in a very different way. And that's not happening. I mean, when I speak to my colleagues in architecture and planning, I mean, they really kind of do the traditional thing, you know, where they assume there's a client and there are beautiful maps with color codes and increasingly 3D and so on. But there's kind of no, sev no street smarts, you know, about what is happening, what's changing, and how do you insert yourself into that. And that's kind of what I'm really looking for in, in terms of the role of the designer. And, and I, I just don't see it. Right? Okay, thank you. Maybe we can open up questions on the other side of the room, Hashim, and then maybe we can go over here. I guess it's more of an appeal than a question. It's an appeal to uh, heightening the radical role of aesthetics uh, and its instrumentality rather than understanding that as a form of abandonment, as comes out in Edgar's diagram. Uh, something comes out of this discussion, which is similar to what I heard in the previous discussion, that has to do with a sense of resentment on the part of designers, that uh, as, especially urban designers, historically, as they tried to make the public aware of the quality of the environment, they also made that quality public, in the sense that they lost control over an aspect that they wanted the world to value by giving it over to the public for deliberation and for discussion. And the line has been drawn along the way. Historically, we can trace that line where aesthetic questions have been left for the architect or designer and the procedural questions were given over to the public for discussion. Uh, I think, Edgar, your diagram explained that very well in the way that you created those oppositions. And we need to question that line, no question. But I also feel that we might need to, instead of playing the role of constantly wanting to give in to the procedure and to give more of the aesthetic to the procedure and therefore engage more, we might need to claim a little bit more authority to the autonomy of the aesthetic and to our authorship, our single authorship, not our collective authorship, uh, at the scale of urban design, at the scale of urban planning as well. Uh, there's a certain dimension to that that has been lost along the way of us thinking that by engaging in the process of liberal democracy, uh, we are effectively transforming things. And I think we have abandoned the ability of the aesthetic to transform by thinking of its collective value as being a necessary value for it. And I'm not sure that a democracy, even a radical democracy, would accept uh, the fact that the aesthetic uh, needs to be collected. Maybe, maybe we could actually answer this question and then move to, uh, to another one. I think this one's worth uh, <laughs> worth, <laughs> worth, uh, uh, worth three questions. Uh, this is, yeah, this, well, actually, it kind of demands a whiskey first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in the absence of that, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, so two points. One is to kind of just a, a slight, I mean, that's why the diagram is clumsy, because that's not quite what I meant with it, what I was more trying to referred to was a, a, a lack in our philosophical register at the moment to talk about the impossibility of coming of contending with the abyss, which is the future, right? So that's kind of, and, and for me, that, that is a poetic moment, right? Of kind of, of contending with that and staring it in the face and not kind of collapsing in oneself. And that the aesthetic is a way of, if you will, processing that a very kind of deep, uh, personal, but in a societal sense as well. And, 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 and so I, I mean in a much kind of broader um, uh, um, um, uh, register in that regard. But to come to your question, which is, which is really <laughs> fantastic. Um, uh, uh, yes, and, and no, and then I'll, 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 I'll kind of qualify it in, in this way, and I'm really thinking at the top of my head here. I mean, I, I do think that we, especially in the South, right, where there's this kind of emergency, this imperative of making people's lives better, right, um, a kind of overwhelming burden of, of, 
being um, of doing the right thing by the collective, by, by the public. Um, I do think that there is a, 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 a devalorization of individual um, kind of authorship of, um, of multiple aestheticisms and a debate about the, the contestation around aestheticism. And, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that the general kind of knowledge project is the poorer book because once you resolve yourself to the utilitarian, right, you immediately foreclose a whole range of, of, of responses to impulses that you can't anticipate what your response will be. And the power of the aesthetic is precisely that. It provokes us to recognize the limits of our thought and experience. And it pushes us to kind of transcend and to go over that line. And so I completely agree, agree with you. But I think there's another aspect to it, which is a collective aspect. And this is, I suppose, my interest and my work around, around public space where I think that there's been a, a fundamental devalorization of the role of, of, and the importance and the healing capacity of a sense of beauty in people's lives. Right? And so the imperative of having a social or public negotiation about what beauty and passion and I suppose to a degree a sense of eroticism may mean in the public domain as a negotiated activity in relation to designers, architects, artists, etc is again, a, it's a massive absence, right? There's no legitimacy to do that because again, the utilitarian is everything. That said, I mean, the few people in my context that are kind of pushing the boundaries in these directions are so far up their own asses that they are completely useless to the bigger discussion about improving design in its functional sense. And that is urgent, that is an emergency. Our schools are terrible, our public libraries look disgusting, right? So there's kind of a, 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 an urgency to, to kind of have a mutuality of respect and a recognition of the codependency of these different moments. And, yeah, so, anyway. I don't know if you guys want to... I just want to clarify something. Um, I also agree with you. In the sense that, uh, I mean, it's difficult to define which our role is, but I would say that... Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, we are designers, and we cannot help it. I mean, and we try to do our best. And I, and I, when when we are working on participation, that doesn't mean that we are giving a pencil to everyone to draw what they want. Because we, of course, we would like some of them, but we would find absolutely disgusting many others. I'm sure. And actually, we have a lot of drawings that uh, we don't care. But we we like about the concepts. We with the our search. Uh, specifically in Hammer, was about what people wanted to do. We don't want to see the shapes, we don't want to see the drawings. We will, we will provide beautiful drawings. That's our you know, expertise, that's, that's what we know how to do. But we wanted to listen to them if they wanted to ice skate in the square, or they want to barbecue, or they want to sandbag. I don't know. And that was the kind of search we've been doing. But of course, we are designers, and I understand our role as medi mediators, in the sense that we collect ideas, concepts, what desires and dreams, and we transform them in beautiful, absolutely aesthetic projects. And that's, uh, well, I'm sure that um, we agree in that, I hope. Uh, because we, we are architects, of course, and, uh, and, uh, and we are professionals. And it's not about that everybody can, uh, you know, draw. It's, it's about translating. And I think it's, it's about translating somehow. I will also add that we also have differences in the way that we look at the process because for me, for example, one of the most powerful parts of this project we launched in, in this city in Norway was that we were there for four months, we opened there an office, and people came there just to, to tell us that they were ready to do something for their city. So one of the main outcomes of this project for me was that we found six, seven people that they wanted to do something for their city. So. As soon as we are leaving, they are organizing themselves in order to run uh, by themselves uh, all kind of stuff in order to make like proposals for the uh, municipality. So I don't know if that's related to aesthetics or not. For me, that's the most uh, powerful and aesthetic uh, maybe thing that we can provide to the city, acting with this idea of being a catalyst. No, I don't know how a catalyst can be involved in aesthetics. This is something that we experiment in the process. I think with that, maybe we can open to one more round of, uh, of questions. So maybe Adrian. 
Jun wasn't allowed to ask a question. <laughs> we're granting we're, 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 we're the pardon. I'm going to go to see you. I like but it can only be one. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I really appreciated your introduction of violence as a kind of crucial um, impasse in terms of contemporary questions about the city. And I wondered if you could expand a little bit on different modes of violence. I mean, you talked, the way you presented it in your talk, you talked about violence in informal communities in Cape Town and in a certain kind of informal violence, maybe a kind of divine violence. But I think um, Stephen Graham's recent book, Cities Under Siege, has kind of really brought to the fore um, conversations about the new military urbanism and the ways in which um, a kind of boomerang effect has taken strategies of um, control in spaces of war, colonial spaces, back to places like the United States, um, capitals, and um, uh, kind of dominant power centers. And so in the United States, you can see something like, you know, recent conversation, the kind of rehashing of the idea of a prison industrial complex and the production of a kind of apartheid in the U.S. after the civil rights movement. Um, so, that, so there's this kind of state violence that I think is very crucial to questions of um, urban design. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. My interest is uh, absolutely, and I, I agree, you know, completely with with, with um, that body of work that is kind of bringing to the fore the uh, um, the kind of driving logics in a way that is setting in increasingly. But what I'm referring to much more is um, in the domain of, of the of the household of the personal, um, the the kind of unspoken or unrecognized consequence of the trauma of the colonial post colonial. Uh, period as precisely the kind of intergenerational and interpersonal uh, dynamics that that has induced, right? And then that gets overlaid with the impossibility of employment for most young people uh, and the gender dimensions of that. And so it is absolutely normal and okay to be pretty much permanently abusive to children and to women in the household. And this uh, in, gets different kinds of racial and ethnic and other inflections in, in various domains. So there's a whole kind of intensity of being um, and a, a kind of a, a negotiation of violence, not just a, a bodily violence, but it's also the violence of absence of food and nutrition and all of that, but also the violence of not recognizing oneself in the reflective surfaces of the city, right? So growing up in Cape Town as a migrant from the Eastern Cape, closer in ethnic orientation and so on, to move every day in the city where you simply see reflective surfaces of some white middle class ideal, I think, you know, is a form of violence, cultural violence, which is completely unacceptable. Right? And I'm in trouble at the moment for kind of, in the, in the, there's a dispute in the local papers about, we've, Cape Town has won the World Design Capital for 2014 competition. Any of you have ever heard of it? Um, anyway, Bilbao and so on is in the running and, but this is kind of, as you can imagine, kind of putting in train a, you know, all the, the architectural firms and the real estate companies and so on are kind of salivating at the mark at the prospect of gentrification and so on and, and urban renewal that comes in its wake. And I kind of had the audacity to, to say that there's something wrong with our imaginary of Cape Town being that we want to be the so southern Europe on the tip of Africa, you know, which is kind of what you know, the real estate industry is aspiring to, and what Cape Town actually is, I mean, it's, uh, to be frank. At least, we, but it does mean you get very good coffee in Cape Town. <laughs> Much better than in Harvard, by the way. And um, so, uh, yeah, so, but anyway, so, I'm going to go I mean, I think with, with, with that note, uh, I think we can end this panel. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, we'll take a five minute break.